Good morning. morning. Welcome to worship this morning. Beautiful day the Lord has given us. Uh, We are going to begin with our call to worship using Luther's morning prayer. Please pray with me. I thank you, my heavenly Father, through Jesus Christ, your dear Son, that you have kept me this night from all harm and danger, and I pray that you would keep me this day also from sin and every evil that all my doings and my life may please you, for into your hands I commend myself, my body and soul, and all things. Let your holy angel be with me, that the evil foe may have no power over me. Amen. Let us rise and sing together, There is a fountain filled with blood.
Let us confess our faith together using the words of the Nicene Creed. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary, and was made man, and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried, and the third day he rose again according to the scriptures, and ascended into heaven, and is seated on the right hand of the Father, and he shall come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead, whose kingdom shall have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. And I believe one holy Christian and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins. And I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. You may be seated. Our Old Testament lesson is from the book of Genesis, chapter 3, verses 8 through 15. And they heard the sound of the the Lord God God walking in the garden in the the cool of the day. day. And the man and his his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. garden. But the Lord God God called to the man and said to him, him, Where are you? you? And he said, said, I heard the sound of you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, and I hid myself. He said, he said, Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten of the tree of which, tree of which, I, commanded which I commanded you not to eat? Not to eat? The, man said, the man said, Well, the woman, the woman whom you gave to be with me, with she gave me fruit of the tree, and I ate. Then the Lord God, the Lord said, God to the said to the woman, What is this, what that, is you this that you have done? The woman said, the woman said Well, the serpent, well, the serpent deceived, deceived me, me, and I ate. The Lord God said to the serpent, Because you have done this, this. cursed are you above all all livestock livestock, and above all beasts of the field. field. On your belly you shall go, and and dust you shall shall eat all the days of your life. life. I will put put enmity enmity between you and the woman, and and between your offspring offspring and her offspring. offspring. He shall bruise your head, head, and you shall bruise his heel. heel. Our psalm is from Psalm 130. Out of the depths depths I cry to you, O Lord. O Lord, Lord, hear my voice. voice. Let your ears be attentive attentive to the voice of my pleas pleas for mercy. mercy. If you, O Lord, Lord, should mark mark iniquities, iniquities, O Lord, Lord, who could stand? stand. But with you there is forgiveness, forgiveness. that you may be feared. I wait for the Lord, my soul waits, and in his word I hope. My soul waits for the Lord more than watchman for the morning, more than watchman for the morning. O Israel, hope in the Lord, for with the Lord there is steadfast love, and with him is plentiful redemption, and he will redeem Israel from all his iniquities. And our epistle lesson is from 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 13 through chapter 5, verse 1. Since we have the same spirit of faith according to what has been written, I believed and so I spoke. We also believe and so we also speak, knowing that he who raised the Lord Jesus will raise us also with Jesus and bring us with you into his presence. For it is all for your sake, so that as grace extends to more and more people, it may increase thanksgiving to the glory of God. So we do not lose heart. Though our outer self is wasting away, our inner self is being renewed day by day. For this light, momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison as we look not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen. For the things that are seen are transient, but the things that are unseen 
are eternal. For we know that if the tent that is our earthly home is destroyed, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. Let us rise and sing together God's word is our great heritage as we prepare for the gospel. gospel lesson for today is from the book of Mark, chapter 7, verses 1 through 30. Now when the Pharisees gathered to him with some of the scribes who had come from Jerusalem, they saw that some of his disciples ate with hands that were defiled, that is, unwashed. For the Pharisees and all the Jews do not eat unless they wash their hands properly, holding to the tradition of the elders, and when they come from the marketplace, they do not eat unless they wash. And there are many other traditions that they observe, such as the washing of cups and pots and copper vessels and dining couches. And the Pharisees and the scribes asked him, Why do your disciples not walk according to the tradition of the elders, but eat with defiled hands? And he said to them, Well did Isaiah prophesy of you hypocrites, as it is written, This people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. In vain do they worship me, teaching as doctrines and commandments of men. You leave the commandment of God and hold to the traditions of men. And he said to them, You have a fine way of rejecting the commandment of God in order to establish your tradition. For Moses said, Honor your father and your mother, and whoever reviles father or mother must surely die. But you say, If a man tells his father or mother whatever you would have gained from me as Corban, that is given to God, then you no longer permit him to do anything for his father and mother, thus making void the word of God by your tradition that you have handed down, and many such things you do. And he calls the people to him again and said to them, Hear me, all of you, and understand, there is nothing outside a person that by going to him can defile him, but the things that come out of a person are what defile him. And he had entered the house and left the people, and the disciples asked him about the parable. And he said to them, Then are you also without understanding? Do you not see what whatever goes into a person from the outside cannot defile him, since it enters not his heart but his stomach, and is expelled? Thus he declared all foods clean. And he said, What comes out of a person is what defiles him. For from within, out of the heart of man, comes evil thoughts, sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, coveting, wickedness, deceit, sensuality, envy, slander, pride, foolishness. All these things come from within that they defile a person. And from there he arose and went away to the region of Tyre and Sidon. And he entered a house and did not want anyone to know, yet he could not be hidden. But immediately a woman whose little daughter had an unclean spirit heard of him and came and fell down at his feet. Now the woman was a Gentile, Syrophoenician by birth, and she begged him to cast the demon out of her daughter. And he said to her, let the children be fed first, for it is not right to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. But she answered him, yes, Lord, yet even the dogs under the table eat the children's crumbs. And he said to her, For this statement, you may go away. The demon has left your daughter. And she went home and found the child lying in bed with and the demon gone. Here ends the reading of God's word. Heavenly Father, we do thank you for your word. We pray that you would be allowing us to hear this word in a way that 
not only does it open our minds to who you are as our God and, and our relationship to our fellow Christians who come and worship with us, but Lord, that it would help to change our hearts, to soften our hearts, to become more like you. And we pray this in Jesus' holy and precious name. Amen. You may be seated. Okay, so you know I've been working through Mark, and if I were to follow the lectionary, the lectionary skips big chunks of Mark and goes back and forth to John, and um, I opted this year to start with the very beginning of Mark and work my way one verse at a time and, and get through the whole thing. I haven't skipped anything yet. Uh, I, I've been holding true to this, and sometimes I've been taking larger chunks. And, and this week I took a larger chunk because it took a little while to read. Thank you for your patience. Um, but as I set that chunk up, I didn't even realize how well it would come into play as, as we compare this week to last week. And we're going to get that at the end of this passage. Uh, I wanted to propose a question to you guys. I want to make you think a little bit. What kind of rules do you think that we should set up to have um, before people were allowed into the sanctuary? Don't you think we need some rules before we let them come into the sanctuary to worship? I mean, there's, there's probably some rules that make sense, right? You should probably be clothed. <laughs> the danger is, is, is where does that stop? You know, what kind of clothes? Are you allowed to wear this or you, do you have to wear that? Is it like a restaurant? No shoes, no shirt, no service? This, this text is dealing with that question. And while I can ask the question, what kind of rules do we need to set up before someone's allowed in the sanctuary, it seems like a ridiculous question, doesn't it? But be honest with yourself. Do you not have preconceived internal notions and ideas of what people should look like before they walk into the sanctuary? I've seen this firsthand. I've told this story before in my last church. And I'm not even going to give the guy too hard a time because, because somebody invited someone to our church. He said he invited him for three weeks study, and on the fourth week, the guy finally came. And that guy came that week. He came the next week. And then the third week, he came. The third week was communion. And this guy had jeans that were just all torn to shreds. He wore an old, tattered leather jacket, and, and it was, I think, a Budweiser t-shirt underneath that was all just torn up, Right? And, and, and he came, and, and you, you never know as a pastor, you know, you see the guy, he, doesn't, does, he seems like he doesn't quite fit into the whole group. I've talked to him a few times, I've gotten to know his name, and he comes forward and receives communion. And before he did, he, he walked most of the way to the altar rail, and then he, he bowed down on one knee and put his head down, and he crossed himself. So I'm thinking, you know, this guy either watches TV, and he got that from that, or he has some church training, and, you know, it, it seems like he was in this heartfelt condition to come to the altar to receive the Lord's Supper. After the service, he came up to me. Most of the people had gone, well, not most, half the people had left the sanctuary, and, and he comes to me after the service and says, Pastor, I feel bad because my clothes, I don't, this is the best that I have when I come to church. And I said to him, I said, you know what, if I had it my way, I'd be preaching in jeans and a t-shirt, so don't worry about what you're wearing. I was trying to make the guy feel comfortable. And the guy who invited him turned around and joined our conversation. He was a few feet away listening turned around and joined our conversation. He was wearing a suit. I don't know, pastor. I think it's good that we all wear suits in church. And he grabbed his lapels and he puffed up his chest and he said, look, Bob over there is wearing a suit and so-and-so over there is got it. He pointed out seven different people who were still wearing suit and tie in the church. Never saw the guy again. Never came back to church. So... Issues like that are real in this world. And in this passage, well, it's not about what you wear. It's about rules that man imposed onto, you know, coming to God and worship and, and being able to be a part of God. And, and so I say, yes, we, 
we all have preconceived notion. There is like things that you should do. You can't come into the church naked. You we're not going to allow that, right? I've got, I know I've got some people in the church that would get someone out of here or at least call the cops. But, but at some point you say, do, is what I see something that would make me hinder someone before they get to be able to come to God? Are they doing something to be outright rude to the church, or are they coming to God with however they can? Um, as we begin here, verse 1, the Pharisees, um, they see Jesus and his disciples, and they see them eating with hands that haven't been ceremonial washed, okay? There was a, a Jewish uh, tradition that your hands had to be washed from your elbows to your knuckles, and I don't know which knuckles, and I don't know why it wouldn't have included your fingertips, but that was, you figure that one out for me. Um, and and I, th I think it, it, some even argue that that would have been an immersion of from your elbows to your knuckles, and it's almost like the way it sounds you could have been out in the field working in the dirt all day, and, and you're, you're, you could have just been filthy, right? But you come in, and you do this ceremonial dip in the water, and then you can go eat with your, what I would think, still filthy hands that were just now wet. But you've done, you've done your ceremonial deed of cleansing, right? And so then you were clean. And Jesus and his disciples are eating, and some Pharisees come along, and are, oh, look, he's doing something wrong. There's also something to know as, as we go through this text. The word in the ESV usually translated is defiled. Um, and that defiled word is the older word unclean. And there are two different words in the Greek that can mean unclean. And one of them is like a filthy, sinful unclean. And the other one is reserved for this ceremonial unclean. Like you haven't gone through the ceremonial process of cleansing, so therefore you're ceremonial unclean. It's not a, and I, I want to make sure you understand this. When I say filthy, the sinful side of that filth is, is involved in that same word. The ceremonial clean doesn't necessarily mean that it is a sinful uncleanness. It just means you haven't gone through the ritual, Okay. So, where did this rule come from? For the Jew of the time, they believed that when Moses went up on the mountain and he received the Ten Commandments from God and he spent time on the mountain communing with God, they believed that Moses received all these other rules, not just about hand washing, but a whole boatload of rules and regulations for, Christ, for the Jewish people and how they should live, right? And that tradition, those rules, were handed down orally over the years, all the way until the intertestamental period, which would be like the 400 years between where the Old Testament ends and where the New Testament begins. And somewhere in there, they all got written down. And somewhere in there, the Jewish religion, the Israelites, began, the Pharisees began imposing them as a way of making sure that you're right with God. And more so than that, it seems, especially as we see in the Gospel of Mark, it seems that the Pharisees are more concerned about making themselves look good by following these rules than any other thing. Okay, so that kind of sets the scene. The Pharisees come in and say, these people are not ceremonial clean, ceremonial, ceremonially, I can't speak, ceremonial cleanly clean. And the Pharisees and the scribes asked him, why do your disciples not walk according to the tradition of the elders, but eat with defiled hands? So here's the big question, and it's walk with the tradition of the elders, as the Pharisees are seeing what they believe to have been spoken to Moses and handed down over, what would it be, two and a half, three thousand years, and then written down in the 400 years prior to Jesus' coming, and now basically instituted as holy law within the church, okay? And to the Pharisees' credit, if you want to stand on the Pharisees' side of this, it's what they know. It's what they've been raised with, right? But 
they're teaching this tradition of men, this orally handed down tradition that they believe has its roots, which would put it on a plane equal to the word of God, but yet it's not the Torah. It is not the word of God for them. So Jesus replies, and he said to them, well did Isaiah prophesy of you hypocrites as it is written. And he uses an Old Testament quote kind of to slam them. This people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. So there he's like, you people can be in the midst of a sinful world of just grossness, but then you'll go and you'll, you'll dip your hands and they'll be all nice and then you can go eat and look good about yourselves. And Jesus is fed up. <clears throat> In vain do they worship me, teaching as doctrines, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. So Jesus is pointing out this oral tradition that was later written down. He is saying this, the commandments of men, is not my Father's word. And, and the Jews would have understood what Jesus was point, saying in that simple of language. Jesus is saying what you are teaching and what you're holding to and what you're requiring your church to follow is not the word of God. And that's like for the Jews to hear Jesus say that, that would be just like somebody coming in here and telling me that the book of John should be stricken from the word of God. I'd be like, no way! You can't do it! That's the Bible. And, and the Jews don't understand that difference. So Jesus gives them an example. And, and we need some education, I'm guessing, because um, Corbin isn't a word that you guys normally hear every day, right? Who knows what Corbin is? Dictionary definition, anybody? Okay, good. That's what I thought. Because <laughs> when pastor has to look it up every time he preaches on it, you know it's not that common. Um, he said, you have a fine way of rejecting the commandments of God. And this Jesus, again, saying, there are commandments in the Torah that you are rejecting in order to put in place your commandments that were oral tradition. And Jesus is saying, how dare you take what you know is God's word and take something that could be questionable about God's word and say that it's more important. And the only reason they're saying it's more important is because they're requiring those commandments. And this was a common thing. So if a man tells his father or mother, whatever you would have gained from me as Corbin, here's that word, that is given to God, you'll no longer permit him to do anything for his father or mother. So let me explain this in, in more modern day English terms, okay? If a guy comes into a church and says to the pastor or to the church council, he says, I want to pledge to this church a thousand dollars a month until I die. Okay, that would be cool, wouldn't it? That was called a gift of, of a Corbin, a Corbin gift, a gift of Corbin. I don't know the exact phrasing, but that's what this is talking about. It is talking about a pledge of, of, of money that would come in and be given in the future. Okay? And then Jesus is saying, what if that man who made that pledge, later his parents are, lose their farm and they're in the poorhouse, and they come to their son, who is, by the commandment, honor your father and mother, uh, is, is required by God's law in the Bible to take care of his parents, right? And what happens then is the Pharisees would enter and say, no, sir, you are not allowed to give to your parents because you have pledged money to the church. And, and, and Jesus notes that this is a common occurrence within the Pharisees and things that go on. And um, not to give Doreen a hard time, maybe the treasurer of the church would be the one driving this home, you know, keep that money rolling in. But no. Jesus points out in such clear terms, your oral tradition does not line up with the word of God. And that should be just as clear evidence as you can possibly have to know that your oral tradition is indeed a tradition of men. It is not what God spoke to Moses on the mountain, which is what they believed, and that would have been very hard for them to hear. Um, you, as if Jesus says to them, you're not listening to the true Father in heaven, so how can you possibly hear me? Or you don't hear the true Father 
Therefore, that's why you reject me. In the way Jesus phrases this argument to the disciples, it's not such a way that it sounds like he's necessarily trying to win the disciples. He's already kind of had it up to here with them. And he's saying, I get you guys. I understand why you reject me. This is why you reject me. It's because you have rejected the Father's word in, in hopes that they can understand that by rejecting the Father's word, they're rejecting him. There's kind of a moral and a lesson in that whole thing, is that when you create a rule that might separate somebody from their God or salvation, you better be darn sure what that rule is all about. Is that rule about making you look good? You know, there's always, there's always jokes, and you can always... We have rules, right? Is there, Marilyn, is there coffee allowed in the sanctuary? <laughs> no coffee in the sanctuary. That's a good rule. It keeps the carpet nice. But we have very few rules, right? Because we do not want to hinder somebody coming to know the Lord. And, and, and that is a very important part of understanding this passage as we have it so far. Okay, and and so Jesus makes this a little bit more of a public spectacle. He called the people to him again and said to them, hear me, all of you, and understand. I mean, Jesus oftentimes will will pull people aside, but and he'll say, "Listen to me," and and or sometimes it's like, "Open your ears and listen." But this is, "Hear me, all of you, and understand." It's like Jesus begging you to open your ears, so you should be like, "What does he have to say? What does he have to say?" There is nothing outside a person that by going into him can defile him, but the things that come out of a person are what defile him. So Jesus moves from one topic of Corbin to the next topic of what you eat, which is another thing that would make you ceremonially unclean if you had eaten the wrong food. And in this passage, we understand is is the main text by where we understand that we as Christians, guess what? We're allowed to eat pork. It's bacon, right? This passage is all about bacon? No. Um. And again, when Jesus speaks here, he's not talking about the the sinful, filthy uncleanness. He's talking about the ritual uncleanness. Um, People were worried that having unwashed hands would make them unable to be in the presence of God. And that worry came from what the Pharisees were teaching. And that had to do with what they were eating. So you go unwashed hands to the eating. Um, Jesus' point here so far is that being in the presence of God has nothing to do with your state of cleanliness. It has everything to do with the state of your heart. Hear that again. Being in the presence of God has nothing to do with the state of your cleanliness. It has everything to do with the state of your heart. And this is the point Jesus is trying to drive home. Verse 17 continues, And when he had entered the house and they left the people and his disciples asked him about this parable, he said to them, Then are you also without understanding? Do you not see that whatever goes into a person from the outside cannot defile him since it enters not his heart but his stomach? Okay, again, Jesus is saying if you're unclean, it's a condition of your heart. It's not a condition of your stomach or intestines or bowels or any of that. It doesn't matter. I like that imagery. You eat a piece of bacon, it goes into your stomach. It doesn't go into your heart. It's kind of like when you're a kid and they say, you are what you eat. Biblical example, you're not. You, you don't turn into a pig, right? <sighs> Food isn't the only thing at issue here. Um, you know, I, I, could, I could mention just like one other thing. Like we, we worship on Sunday. 
That change was made after Jesus rose from the dead on Sunday, and then the Holy Spirit was given to the church on Sunday. And the church says, we ought to be celebrating these occasions and doing it on Sunday. And in so, um, the part of the Old Testament law that has been I like the word abolished, but I like the word fulfilled in what Christ has done on the cross. It drives to completion in the Christian church when when we see that that regulation of being able to be presented to God through this spiritual cleanliness, this not being unclean because of the ceremonial deeds that you have done, they're set aside so that we can be in the presence of our Creator and our Savior. And it's a wonderful, beautiful gift to us. Um, Food doesn't go into you and then into your heart and soul. It's just a fact. Um, I suppose, you know, you could, my brother always joked, he used to drink a lot of Coca-Cola. And and the joke in the family was always like, just set him up an IV so you could put it right into the veins. And if you did something like that, you could probably get it into your heart. But the, the understanding here isn't the organ. The understanding is your soul, yourself, your psyche, what makes you who you are. And Jesus' frustration with the Pharisees builds because they don't know what sin is. They're trying to avoid it with a strict diet. They don't know what makes them unclean. And he said, what comes out of a person is what defiles him. For from within, out of the heart of man... Out of our own hearts. He's not saying out of you any specific person, but I can identify with this list, and I think you guys can identify with this list, and I'll remind you why when I'm done reading it. Evil thoughts, sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, coveting, wickedness, deceit, sensuality, envy, slander, pride, foolishness. All of these things come from within, and they defile a person. Like that list, it might not be in the exact same order, but it hits on it just about all of the last seven of the Ten Commandments. All the commandments that have to do with our relationship with our neighbors. It doesn't really touch on our first three commandments to talk about our relationship with God. Um, But they're all there. And, And we all fail at them. And those commandments, it's interesting here that Jesus, again, uses the word for ritually unclean. Those things make you separated from God. They, 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 they put this condition on you. It's called sin. We know it full well. God calls upon us to come to the Savior, to come to the cross, to recognize and understand that Jesus died for that sin. He came to save us. Frustration Jesus has is he comes to the world and he lives a perfect life and he begins his teaching ministry And he's teaching these people about who he is, and they are rejecting him. He came to teach them and to save them. And rather than them rejoicing that he was there as their Messiah, they were rejecting him rather than rejoicing. He came to save them from their sin. He came to save you from your sin. The text shifts a little bit here. And pardon me, it was like I could save this for next week, but... I, I couldn't, because this ties into what we talked Remember last week, we had a boat and a storm, and before the boat and the storm, we had a feeding of 5,000. And I don't know if you remember, but after the feeding of the 5,000, the disciples were bewildered and amazed. They're like, oh, what's going on? And then in the boat, when Jesus walks along the water and just hops in the boat and calms the storm, the disciples were still, oh, what's going on? Bewildered and amazed, Right? But the text there said they were bewildered and amazed because of the feeding of the 5,000, because of the bread that was left over pouring out of the 12 baskets that were too plentiful for all the 5,000 people to eat when they started with five loaves and two fish. If you remember the point, the big point from that last week, I'm going to get to it and I'll remind you of it. Immediately a woman whose daughter had an unclean spirit heard of him and came and fell down at his feet. The woman was a Gentile, a Syrophoenician by birth. She begged him to cast the demon out of her daughter and, she, and he said to her, 
Let the children be fed first, for it's not right to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. How rude of Jesus. Did you catch that? This woman comes begging for her daughter's life, and Jesus is like, let the children be fed first. You know what he's saying? He's saying his family, the Jews, need to be fed by my teaching first. And he's doing it to make a very clear point, especially if you paid attention last week. Okay, In this Syrophoenician Gentile woman who arguably doesn't deserve to be in the presence of, of Jesus comes to him and begs for his mercy and asks him to heal, to cast a demon out of her daughter, right? And she is the one that makes the theological point of this message and the last message. She is the one, this woman who hasn't had the Jewish upbringing and training and all the school and all that. After Jesus says, let the children be fed first, for it's not right to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. But she answered him, yes, Lord, yet even the dogs under the table eat the children's crumbs. And this, the crumbs, is talking about the bread, okay? And if you can't make this connection in this passage with this woman coming to Jesus and asking for the demon to be cast, you may as well not even know what it's talking about. You just may as well not care about it. It's just another little demon that gets passed out. But this woman says, even, even the people that are outside of the church can receive some of those leftovers, that Jesus just tried to make the point with, with five loaves that turned into 12 baskets overflowing and sent them with you know, one basket for each disciple, that each disciple is able to have overflowing. Not only can you feed the Jews, but the, the leftovers. When God's word is visible in somebody's life, it trickles out and it changes the lives of the people around them. And this woman sees it, she recognizes it, and she asks that some of those leftovers might just trickle out onto her, onto her child. And, she, and he said to her, for this statement, you, go, me, you may go your way. The demon has left your daughter. And she went home and found the child lying in bed and the demon gone. And I'm sure you, you, you got to picture Jesus like, I can't get through to the educated people that are supposed to know who I am. And this woman comes and she understands and comprehends fully. And, and I put myself in this story and I say, man, I, I, hope I, would have, I hope I would have the whereabouts to be that woman to go to Jesus. And I hope each and every one of you, because the woman's whereabouts to be able to go to Jesus and ask that is the same thing that it takes a sinner like me to be able to go to the cross and say, I'm a mess up, I'm a screw up, I'm a failure, and I need your help. I need your salvation. And that's what this book is all about. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We pray that you would truly help us to understand what it means to have your leftovers. <laughs> your leftovers, Lord, to be blessed and lavished your grace upon us through what Christ has done for us on the cross. We thank you so much for that gift. We pray that in Jesus' holy and precious name. Amen. Let us rise and sing together. Let us break bread together.
us confess our sin with the words on the screen. Heavenly Father, we come before you this morning because of our old nature. There's a part of us that only wants to make us turn away from you and do that which is evil. At times, Father, we have given in to this old nature and have sinned and fallen short of your glory. We confess this to you so that you may forgive us and cleanse us from that unrighteousness and make us as your children again. Wash us and make us clean in your sight. In the precious name of Jesus Christ, amen. Declaration of Grace is from Psalm 103, verse 12. As far as the east is from the west, so far does he remove our transgressions from us. Amen. Let us sing together, sent forth by God's blessing. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen.